Welcome to the Inside View, a podcast where we forecast technological progress starting from our gut level intuitions. I am your host, Michael Perazzi. For people watching this on YouTube, what you're seeing is a screen recording of how I randomly met Connor Lee at an internet party. Connor is a ML researcher at Adolf Alpha, a German company shaping European research and development for the next generation of generalizable artificial intelligence. He's most well known for being one of Eleuther AI's founding member, a decentralized grassroots collective of volunteer researchers, engineers and developers focused on AI alignment, scaling and open sourcing AI research. For listeners not familiar with AI alignment, it is often used to point at research aiming to build scalable AI systems that do what we want them to do. My current experience with Eleuther was mostly through their Discord, where people coordinate on open source projects, discuss deep learning research, and, most importantly, exchange deep learning gossips and 9000 IQ memes. In my opinion, Eleuther's flagship achievements are to have open source both 1. the code to train GPT-3-like models, referred as GPT-Neo and GPT-Neo-X, and 2. the pile, a clean dataset they created themselves to train those GPT-3-like models. In the first part of the podcast, we chat about how to speed up GPT-3 training, how Connor updated on recent announcements of large language models, why GPT-3 can be considered AGI for some specific definitions of AGI, the obstacles in plugging planning to GPT-N, and why the brain might approximate something like backprop. We end this first part with Solomon of Priors, adversary attacks, just Pascal mugging, and whether direct work on AI alignment is currently tractable. In the second part, we chat about how these current projects at Luther, multiple scenarios, and reasons to work on technical AI alignment research. Without further ado, Connor Lee. Hello again. Hey, can you hear me fine? Yep. Okay, so like, just let me give you some, some context about the, the whole podcast thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I want people to talk about short timelines and I want people to give inside views about what they think about AI and not censor themselves. So obviously you're one obvious candidate. Falls <laughs> <laughs> to that category, yes. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. This is my, okay, this is my second time recording one. So I am pretty much new to it. So, hello, Connor. How are you doing? Hi, doing well. Cool. Yeah, um, I, I recently saw one of your retweets uh, because you're quite prolific on Twitter, and it was about like a, um, a Chinese paper that uh, went on for a few months and was recently translated to English, and apparently is the new thing. Um, what do you think about it? So I assume we talked about the rotational embeddings. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's a fun. That's a funny little story. So I'm not super involved with that. Um, I just kind of saw it from the sidelines. Basically, what happened was a Chinese researcher, uh, like over the few course of a few months, produ- uh, wrote a few Chinese blog posts about a new transformer technique, about a new positional encoding technique specifically, that seemed to be have interesting properties. Um, someone at Eleuther, which uh, is like the open source Stella? collective um, part of yeah. Uh, Stell was one of the people involved. I think Pratal was the one who first uh, made us aware of it, if I remember mm-hmm. correctly. Uh, he posted like, hey, this seems interesting. So we use like Google Translate to like, reverse engineer what they were doing. So apparently this has been like um, spoken about in Chinese NLP circles. And we ran a bunch of experiments and it was the first like uh, simple quote unquote tweak to these kinds of things that we've seen in a long time that seemed to make like an, any appreciable difference. So especially for small models, it made convergence, uh, so training time, much faster. Uh, the, uh, seems to diminish in lar- at larger sizes, but it's still like significant, it's still a few percentage points and such, and like speed increase and such. That's pretty cool. So we oh, decided to write a English blog post about it. We reached out to the author. We were like, hey, uh, we really like your work. We'd like to write a blog post about it. So then he released his paper in English, and we released a blog post at the same time. Well, we, I, I wasn't involved in writing the blog post, the research. Right. Okay. So you helped um, publish a blog post. And I, I think, like, since today, there's like a paper uh, published. Because it's more about speed than and, and actual uh, reducing the bottleneck. Is the bottleneck in 
kind of the NVIDIA link and like all the uh, optimization when training transformers or? So um, the bottleneck for training transformers is um, for scaling, it's um, the, uh, the interconnect speed, yeah, as you mm -hmm. described. So like the connecting between nodes, but also within nodes, like the NVLink, the NV switch between the individual GPUs and also like the uh, infinite band link between which you, you want, basically you want infinite band, even that is pretty difficult uh, between nodes to get good scaling. The bottleneck is ultimately compute. So flops, mm -hmm. just pure raw GPU flops. Um, and nowadays, if you if you get expensive machines, if you know they have like InfiniBand and whatever, you can scale pretty well. And then it just depends on how many GPUs can you buy. Okay, I, I, I was just interested in like the specific trick that this Chinese paper did. Yeah, the specific uh, trick we haven't applied it to very large models. Um, it's basically just like it's kind of like a free small improvement. It doesn't change anything fundamental about the architecture really. It's more like a you add, it's a different way of doing positional encodings in the network which um, seems to give a pretty significant speed, speed increase, um, not in execution, but in training time. So you need fewer steps to convert to the same loss, which is pretty significant for smaller models. And it like loses some efficiency with larger models. We've tested up to a billion parameters, I think. We haven't tested it yet with larger models. I think we're currently in the process of testing it on even larger models, but we don't have results for that yet. Right, so it's it kind of finds a better way, a better path in like the training. Uh... Yeah, you need, less, you need less steps to get to mm -hmm. the same amount of training, sure. at least for small models. And so m more generally, like recently, um, uh, I think Facebook uh, open source uh, their recommender system. And they said there were like trillions of parameters. Uh, Microsoft shows something similar. And, and NVIDIA uh, had these like ballsy claims about training GPT-3 in a few days and, and maybe scaling to trillions of parameters. So yeah, what do you think about all these like new um, topics around uh, scaling up. Yeah, so yeah, you have to disentangle some of that. So the Facebook for thing is, I would not, ex you can't compare it to a like dense model like GPT-3. Like the, the parameter numbers don't mean anything if it's a different, like recommender systems are very, very different architectures. They're extremely sparse. They don't use all the parameters the same way GPT-3 does. So you can't really compare them. Mm -hmm. So it is just a completely different architecture. Um, sure. Um, for the um, NVIDIA thing, that's uh, scary. That's something that has like <laughs> updated my um, timelines quite six, not, like non like non negligibly. Um, on Discord before you were saying that um, you you didn't quite update from uh, if I remember correctly Wally -E or GPT three because you already had crazy timelines and so you didn't update that much <laughs> and now you're saying you're updating yeah. from NVIDIA. <laughs> I am not also not significant because my timelines are so extremely <laughs> short. I, I've like updated my confidence for like you know like uh, like ten to fifteen percent or something, which is significant. Well, okay, yeah, so it's like five times. Um, so yeah, basically what Nvidia talked about is that they're introducing new um, systems that they claim will be able to train um, trillion parameter models in three days, which. Mm -hmm technically might be possible even with current hardware if you have enough of it. Uh, I haven't run the numbers on that. Sure. Because, um, yeah, yeah, I, I think we don't really know how all those um, optimization works um, in detail, like at the hardware level. So yeah, I, I just want to like bounce off on a bunch of claims you, you made on the, um, another podcast called uh, Street ML Podcast, I guess. Um, which were both funny and true, which is, uh, let's start with um, GPT-3 is AGI. I know, I know you did it for the memes, but... Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so that was a bit for the meme, of course. Um, <laughs> we, we I, that, that was, it was a fun podcast, you know, we were a bit silly, <laughs> so we said some silly things. Um, but yeah, I do believe that um, for a certain definition of, of AGI. The thing is, AGI doesn't really mean anything anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, the term just means nothing. Yeah. Everyone has their own definition of it. It doesn't mean anything. So, so when I say AGI, what I mean is it is a um, it is a qualitative. It's not like a binary thing. Like, oh, it either is AGI or it isn't. Mm. It's more like a spectrum. Mm. And like, um, for me, artificial general intelligence just means it is, it is a system trained on like some simple objective that is somehow able to solve many useful problems. And for my definition, GPT-3 is trained on a simple text predicting uh, objective, but is able to solve many very valuable tasks. 
summarization and sure. text writing and sounding. So, yeah, I, I think that's like, I, I talked to one engineer, Nayai, uh, who gave me the definition of like automating 50% of knowledge work, which is kind of uh, relevant to like our economy and not that hard for, you know, language models uh, right now. So I, I think, and, and like to, to bounce off of like, like let's not speak about intelligence, but let's speak about useful things and what matters. Um, I loved I loved this rule you gave, which is which now I'm calling Connor's rule, which is to never mention the suitcase the suitcase word intelligence. <laughs> so let's apply the Connor rule in that color right. Connor podcast and not talk about intelligence. Um, so okay, so we we had this prior conversation about. Uh, GPT-3, like uh, how, how should we go from that to like an agent that could interact with the world and, um, you know, do planning, like uh, do actions and stuff. And I remember you saying um, that one of your crux was, so a crux is for people who are not familiar with it, is a fact that will change your mind about, um, about the world, uh, if it happens or not. So a, a crux um, Connor had was whether um, reinforcement learning, um, the part where we try to um, merge GPT-3 with some kind of reinforcement learning agent uh, was not the hard part. And that the hard part was actually coming up with like this transformer architecture, which can scale a lot. Um, so yeah, do you, do you have um, any new takes on that or do you want to expand on, on this? Yeah, I mean, you, you hit it on the head. So there is obviously some things that uh, we probably would need for GPT three, sorry, GPT N, you know, future mm -hmm. model to be considered. Uh, so I prefer the like, transformative AI when talking about you know automating knowledge work or having like, sure. economy or whatever, whether we call it that or not, whatever. Uh, but have like a very powerful system. Um, in a sense, you could argue whether or not GPT three has any kind of goal system or not. Like you could make the argument, oh, it can simulate a goal agent, even so itself has not a, doesn't have a goal. You can make it write a character that has a goal. And mm -hmm. output actions that way and stuff like yeah. that. But I expect in the future the way this, this is going to look as described will have GP3 or GPN as some kind of world model that a RL agent interfaces with to make predictions of the world and make better decisions. And I expect this to be easy. Um, I mean, easy in big scare quotes. Still, you know, it's going to take time. It's going to be hard mm -hmm. to have the right architecture or whatever. But easy in the sense that I don't think we need any like fundamental theoretical breakthrough to build this. Yep. Um, I guess I guess the breakthrough could be inside of like reinforcement learning uh, at the moment, which is um, just like it's not very simple efficient in terms of um, being confronted to like the normal like complexity of um, you know sensory perception and stuff. And, yeah, but I mean, you can uh, look at like the Dreamer architecture, for example, sure. which is super sample efficient because it's trained inside of a world model. I think the reason RL doesn't work is is because they're not using world models. Interesting. Yeah, I, I need to look at look more in, into the paper. Um, yes, yeah, so like modern based reinforcement learning has becoming more and more popular lately, lately and sure. I expect that to continue. Uh, but but still, like the the actual you know world model, like the the GIF that I remember of like in, in dreaming of like uh, driving a car, um, it's still like a few actions. Like maybe you can go left and go right. Um, when when you're trying to like ask a world model. Um, when you try to like do prompt engineering and talk to like a language model, like your action space is, is huge, right? So even if you're a bit more simple efficient, it's still very hard. Well, it, it's pretty clear to me that prompting is an inferior method of how to use these models. So one of my hot takes or one of my cruxes here is that I actually think GPT-3 is much smarter than people think it is because of the task it's actually trained on. I, I conceptualize GPT-3 as an extremely intelligent model that is pretending to be a median internet user. Yeah. So yeah. I think that the way that inside the model is actually like a lot of useful information that you is like hard to get or like you know a prompt doesn't necessarily um, is able to extract easily. And mm -hmm. we've already been seeing this with like prompt tuning and whatever that like continuous prompts that are like trained through back prompt yep. or whatever that we're getting better and better techniques. We have better and better performance out of these models. So I, I expect there to be, so as I would expect the reinforcement learning agent to not literally give a natural language query to the model, but rather to have like a differentiable um, interface with its right. hidden states. Okay, so, so you're essentially saying that uh, like language, <laughs> like human language is 
a bad way of interfacing between uh, you know AI models, <laughs> which exactly. is yeah yeah this is pretty yeah I agree with the claim, um, and um, and yeah you you also said in this other podcast that um, humans were not yeah Voldemort like the, the world we're not uh, able to say they're not intelligent, <laughs> um, and and it's also that um, we're like humans are approximating GPT three not the opposite so. Yeah, can you go more uh, on that? Because I found it fascinating. So that was definitely something I've been saying for the meme. But uh, <laughs> I would say I believe that with like, a, I do like believe it more than other people do, but I have like very little evidence for what that even means. So that yeah. was like somewhat of a meme. But like in a sense, um, there's something, it's like the more we see how bio, like there's recently been like uh, several papers, one of them being on like Copfield Networks is all you need, where you show that like uh, predictive processing, predictive coding, type uh, architectures can um, approximate backprop in arbitrary computational graphs. Mm -hmm. So basically, we see these like uh, predictive coding signaling in neurological neurons. And we now know like mathematically, these can approximate a backprop signal. And just empirically, we've seen many, many times that like if you um, uh, try to implement like biological um, constraints that exist in biological networks, um, they often, they, they generally don't outperform a pure backprop. So my current working model, and my work for hypothesis is that, um, is that the backprop is not literally implemented in the brain, not because backprop isn't good, but because it's like not feasible because of hardware constraints. Is that um. if the brain could implement backprop, it would just implement backprop. So because backprop is so perfect, because we can implement it in our GPUs, it's actually a more pure version of what the brain is trying to um, approximate. So I actually interviewed um, uh, Kristen one, one time about this too, mm -hmm. and I asked him, hey, what do you think about backprop? And he said, yeah, it all ends up to be the same thing. It's all minimizing free energy and vari uh, variational uh, Bayesian models. And whether or not you believe Kristen on this part or would think it's trivial, which- Which, which is, Kristen? Uh, Carl Kristen. Okay. He's a very famous neuroscientist who has a, Kind of like a unifying theory of the brain, which is also kind of trivial, but also super complicated. It's a long story. But basically, his whole point is that although the way the thing the brain does is it, it minimizes variational free energy of a Bayesian model, which is a very fancy word of saying it minimizes loss of a predictive model. Sure. Yeah. Um, and whether you do that with backprop or predictive coding or some other algorithm, it doesn't really matter. They're like all in min not like literally equivalent, but they're like they're all approximating some kind of like Bayesian update. And backprop seems to be a especially pure, like especially efficient way of doing kind of like mm -hmm. approximating some kind of Bayesian update, at least for the kinds of systems we use. So what I meant by that statement is basically saying, I think the brain may be trying to approximate a like a numerically pure backprop, but has to do all these hacks to because um, you can't have you know 32 bit floating point numbers in neurons. It's just not just too much noise. So you have to do like all these like error correction and all this like fuzziness. But then there's like also like um, physical, um, you know, tension, electricity being continuous. So it's it 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 also has more flexibility than, flexibility than us. Like it doesn't have those problems of you know numbers becoming too small and like a, a double approximation. Um, it has also like more flexibility on some points. Uh, do you mean the brain? Yeah. Or I disagree. I think the brain has less flexibility than we do. The brain can't represent an arbitrarily precision number. It's all there's too much noise. The brain can't uh, show arbitrarily large or small numbers. You know, you can't just have a neuron sure. encode an arbitrarily large number or an arbitrarily small number. There is a in many ways, if you just look at neurons and just like look at them, you know, spiking, it's pretty obvious to me that they're trying to approximate a digital system. That's the whole point. It's trying. To, it's not a, mm. an analog system. And if there's one thing we've learned from the history of computer science is, is that analog systems never work out. Is they always sound great on paper, but they never work. We always default back to a, to a digital system because they work. Digital mm. systems are just because of the error correction of, of effect of um, these things. You don't have these compounding errors that you get in analog systems. Yeah. And yeah, what about um, like where? What, what about quantum physics? Like maybe maybe there's something the, the brain is a huge wet mess warm mess this is the worst possible scenarios for quantum effects to have any meaning i see there's currently no evidence whatsoever that the brain significantly exploits quantum effects and even if it did um i don't see how it, like you can't have any long-term entanglement so it might be like some kind of like small effects on like protein levels 
But I mean, the quantum isn't magic either. It's just, it, that would just get, bring us from the P class yeah. complexity to, to BQP, yeah. which might be, I mean, I can imagine if the whole brain was at, you know, zero Kelvin and was an extremely complicated, you know, matrix of superconducting circuits. Okay, then maybe there's some quantum effects going on. But I don't, I can't see how a quantum entangled state sure. would not be to here in a system like that. Makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I was just trying to think about um, like the, the best Seelman like counter arguments, like what would be like something that would make you change your mind on um, like, um, like a brain approximating some other function. Um, so yeah, maybe it's something like in the space of quantum computing or maybe, maybe bad prop is an optimal yeah, what would be like like the best steel man of the other position? I mean, it's it's less that I'm saying is approximating one specific algorithm. It's more like in my is that all these algorithms kind of collapse to the same thing. It's like whether you use quicksort or insertion sort or whatever sort, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're sorting the list. And there's many different ways you can do it depending on what hardware, what your data looks like, whatever. So I think what the brain is doing is, to a large degree, at least what the neocortex is doing, is that it is building predictive models of its environment. It's 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 you know it's it's minimizing the loss of a, some kind of like Bayesian var variational Bayes model of its environment. Whether it does this literally through backprop or literally through predictive processing or whatever, is kind of just an implementation detail. Like mm. what these Hopfield paper showed us is that they're mathematically they all kind of average out to the same thing. So. Is it okay? So, are we saying kind of that they converge towards what would be a uh, true Bayesian update from some kind of Solonoff induction and they try to like update, update towards um, and, and, and like backprop is um, maybe the easiest or um, elegant way of appro uh, approximating some Bayesian reasoning at some point. That's my work here, Bob. So, I mean, Bayes is like provably the optimal way on updating mm -hmm. your information. We don't have to bring Sol Amanoff into that. I have some spicy opinions about Sol Amanoff you don't have to get into. Please, give me, give me the spicy. Give me the spicy. I think Sol Amanoff is inco mathematically incoherent. I think it's actually not, like, it's an interesting idea to think about, but I don't think you can draw as many conclusions from it as people think you can. Mm -hmm. Because you're basically my, my um this should be congress law the minute you introduce a halting oracle it's no longer true <laughs> it's like you know it's, it's, it's like you're not allowed to introduce a halting oracle that that's just it, it's forbidden it's like introducing a you know p equals not p you know you're not allowed oh, to do that you, you mean because he, he doesn't consider halting oracles or, well, no, or he, and the problem is that to slum enough induction is fundamentally not halting you know it's halting complete to, to actually execute or to, to get the distribution of Solomonoff, the pri Solomonoff prior can only be computed by a halting oracle. It cannot be computed in finite time. And that, and there's a big difference between something that takes uh, infinite steps or takes you know, arbitrarily many steps mm -hmm. and something that takes halting steps to do. And Solomonoff is, takes a halting oracle to be able to compute because it's, you know, it, it's running over universal Turing machines or all possible programs. Mm -hmm. And many of those will not halt. So to, in order to get the distribution over the non-halting programs, you need to have a halting oracle. Yeah, I need to, I need to look back into the paper, but I, I cannot I cannot remember from his first paper on that, uh, I think 1969 or 1960, 70, sorry. He was definitely trying not to go into uh, not halting territory. And like he like says, we're going to like take only um, you know um, Turing machines that halt. Um, yeah, but there's no way to prove whether a Turing machine halts or not. Like, but if you give, if I give you an arbitrary Turing sure, machine, sure, there's yeah, no yeah. way you can prove it. So That's you can never construct this system. So like, I'm a constructivist. I think, so like I, re so okay, this gets us into deep math logic. But mm -hmm. I reject, for example, the law of excluded middle. So like there's, yeah. in, 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 in classical logic, you have the like, you know, either P or not P. Mm -hmm. I reject that. I think that's not true. Um, and because basically with that, you introduce a halting oracle into your uh, logic system. Sure. And okay. you also introduce good incompleteness. So mm -hmm. to, have a, to have a consistent system of mathematics, you have, at least in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, you can't have the law of excluded middle and you can't have non halt like you can't have a halting oracle in your system. But to construct uh, um, the distribution of a Salamina prior, you need a halting oracle. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, I think I think I get what you mean. I, I need to reread the paper to understand it better. 
Um, and to be clear, I'm not an expert on this. I just, you know, I'm. This is just my intuition and what I've picked up from learning and reading about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I also think the the universal fryer has like probably very strange properties mm -hmm. that we actually don't want our agent to have. Also, there's the problem of the choice. So this might be the a less weird explanation of why I think the Solomon of Fryer is incoherent. Mm -hmm. So I think Hutter actually recently released a paper on this, like mm -hmm. 2019, that you to, to define your Solomon of Fryer, you have to define an, a universal Turing machine. But there are infinite possible universal Turing machines, mm -hmm. and your choice is arbitrary. So there are infinitely many possible Solomon of Fryers, and they can, and depending on your choice of Solomon of Fryer, you can your agent can actually your IC agent can actually perform arbitrarily bad on any distribution. Interesting. Yeah. Um, like so that's why I say it's incoherent. Because like it's a long enough claims there is one unique true universal prior, and mm. that's not true. There are infinite of them, and none of them is privileged over the other. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I, I see. I see um, where you're coming from with this uh, Marcus paper. Um, from what I remember reading the Sol Solomon of paper, he, he was trying to get to the point of something very um, like understandable by human. Where you, I think you, 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 you know it already, but like you have a sequence of like A, B, B, A, B, B, A, 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 and then you say like, oh, this is like a permutation of A and B, and so you just give like the 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 K that corresponds to the cardinal of of this permutation uh, among n factorial, and and then like, um, if you if you repeat that enough uh, with a bunch of three machines, at some point you get something purely random, right? So, um, so I I I feel like somehow this like permutation thing um where like this permutation encoding is some somehow the like universal prior uh natural like he was aiming for and um but maybe maybe utter like shows that you know um you can adversarially attack uh those things um and yeah i get yudkowski uh showed that you can mug <laughs> you, you can do pascal mugging and, and so on um yeah and and like did you like, are you actually concerned about Pascal mugging, or uh, is it for you like a like a funny talk experiment? I mean, Pascal in mugging is kind of like a spectrum. Like some people say, climate change is a Pascalian mug mugging, technically. You know, because like someone comes up to you and says, "Hey, fifty years, the world's gonna burn, so you know, pay me money to reduce CO 2 Is mm. that a Pascalian mugging? I wouldn't think so. I think that's just reasonable, you know, thinking. Mm, yeah, so, just sorry to interrupt, and just like to introduce to like listeners that are not familiar with that, Pascal. Maybe you can like explain what Pascal mugging is. Um, sure. So the Pascalian mugging is kind of like a, a like a thought experiment where someone comes up to you and gives you some really ludicrous um, scenario that you think is like really unlikely, but threatens that the scenario will be like extremely bad unless you do something for him. It's like the classic is like you know a mugger comes up to you and say, hey. I'm actually God. Um, I'm going to create infinite people that suffer infinitely unless you give me five dollars. So you should give me five dollars. One, one important point, though, is that uh, they're not saying something very weird. Um, where um, because like in, in, in Yudkowsky's claim is that um, they say I'm going to give you three uh, arrow uh, arrow arrow three uh, dollars, or I will kill three arrow arrow three. People, which is um, new uh, um, notation for saying very, very big numbers, um, and those numbers are actually very high in the um, Solomonov prior, because you can build a simple tree machine that compute those. Uh, but they're like so big that like even if you consider every possible scenarios and you try to like say make uh, give a probability to like this guy saying the the right thing. Uh, in expected in expected value, because your prior is so high compared to like his claim, you will say like, oh, I need to give money to this guy. <laughs> um, and yeah. so, the, in my in my understanding for AI, um, so the general claim is like if when we have a prior, like imagine like even if we have like transformers or like other architectures and they have a prior of all like what's reasonable and they do planning, is there a way to hack them? With something that, that has high prior for them, and and will trick them into like believing is very high expected value, right? Um, I mean that's what visceral examples are in a way. You know you can find like weird permutation of images that trick the 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 network to be like super confident of like something. Yeah, exactly. Very similar idea. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, robustness to um, adversarial examples is always dependent on your distribution. It's like, you know, you can make an agent robust to certain distributions of events. And I don't know, I'm not an expert on this. So like, I don't know how hard it is to make them. I assume there's probably some, I don't actually know if this is true, but I assume there's probably some proof that like for an, a large enough set of environments and then bounded agent, you can always find like something that they can't handle or it does something weird. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that's probably the case, but I don't know if that's actually true. So don't call me on that. Right. So, so something like no lunch, but for, for like RL. Yeah, something like mm -hmm. that. I'm pretty sure a theorem like that exists, but I wouldn't actually know. Um, okay, so right now I'm going to just pretend for a while that I'm not very um, convinced about AI alignment, and I'm trying to, and I will try to steal man one of the arguments from the previous podcast, um, which is that um, we're actually um, making a lot of premises with instrumental convergence, and um, um, also. Um, so there is instrumental convergence, uh, instrumental goals, and orthogonal um, orthogonal thesis. So to explain to the readers, to the listeners, uh, orthogonal thesis is that you can have uh, arbitrarily uh, high intelligence and arbitrarily uh, bad moral values at the same time. Um, and um, convergent in instrumental goals are that as as humans we want um, to stay alive, to um, you know do stuff we care about, and any agent that would have an utility, utility function might consider to survive to um, you know, um, pursue his goal. And he might also want to compute uh, to uh, do better predictions and, and so on. So those are kind of um, claims made by Bostrom and Yudkowsky um, that are quite fundamental to like all this kind of stack of AI alignment arguments you talk about, uh, where um, if you don't buy any one of those arguments, then you're not. Um, um, yeah, convinced of it. So yeah, um, could you could you try to tell man like how those kind of basic arguments could be wrong, um, like instrumental conver convergence and um, you know orthogonal? <laughs> or is it too hard? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so I don't think you have to buy every of those arguments to be concerned about AIs, especially nowadays since we have like a much wider old than just you know a few people on a weird transhumanist trans uh, you know a mailing list back in the day as for we now you know we now have a much wider swath of people care about these things and finding like real arguments about things so, like it's hard for me to steal man some of these arguments uh, some of them i can like some of them kind of make sense but they miss the point so like a, a like an argument that is valid against the orthogonality thesis a version of the orthogonality thesis i consider a straw man is some people say well you know an like a very stupid agent can't have a very complicated goal. So technically you can't have any agent with any goal. And like, okay, fine. But that's obviously missing the point of the thought experiment. Yep. So another version, so like the only steel men I could think of, um, I'm sorry if I'm doing a bad job, uh, this is the best I can do. Um, <laughs> one is, is that people believe in strong moral realism. So people believe if you just create something arbitrarily intelligent, it will just all convert to the same morality and just become good. So this is something you hear sometimes among the transhumanist folk or like singularitarian folk. They're like, oh, the AI will just be so enlightened and good. It will know what the correct thing to do is just do that. Like um, Schmidt Huber also has a version of this. So uh, that's one possible argument. Um, like, another can, possible argument. Hmm? We could say that somehow like, um, like Kolmogorov complexity and like we can kind of have like more like, um, you know, doing good is maybe more simple than, um, you know, um, torturing a billion people with uh, weird dreams. Uh, the so, simplest scenario is just to maximize entropy and everything, just destroy everything. That's the simplest policy. It's just a random policy. Everything true. else is more complicated. So, <laughs> yeah, that's like what a little Yukoski calls the hidden complexity of wishes or the like the frig fragility of values is that. What humans want is actually really complicated. That's why we need energy to be out where it's a very low entropy state in which humans exist, in which there is value or art or beauty or anything other than like a finely diffused plasma. Mm -hmm. Everything that's not a finely diffused plasma is a complicated state and requires like very energy to maintain. We're all, they were moving towards heat death of the universe. Everything's going to be a very fine, you know, mist of black holes and protons and whatever. 
in, into infinity at some, some point. And everything else requires energy to maintain neg or negative entropy in that sense. So the, 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 so like one of the arguments that is, you know, it goes against a strong realism claim is that just it's things that humans want are not like privileged in a sense. It's not like all aliens and all intelligent, all computer programs just spontaneously decide to want the same things as humans want. That seems pretty outrageous to me. Like, why would that be the trade case? Like, I could just literally just write down a program. If what human wants, do opposite. Like, you know, I could, I could just write that program. And that, that's an existence proof that I can write an AI that does the opposite of what humans want. Or, you know, so something random, just like, if action, do random. You know, at the end, there you go, you have a random policy that just no human values it. So I don't believe the strong moral, moral realism and the strong moral convergence. So, so your your program, if if you were to program something that says um, do what the human doesn't want, then it should like kind of include everything the human wants, and so it it would kind of have the understanding of human values, even if it doesn't follow it. But it would have the understanding of human values. It might have an understanding, yes, but it would not execute them. And honestly, sure. and that's what I care about. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care if the torture AI knows I don't want to be tortured. <laughs> if it's torturing me, it's not. I want it's not torture me. It's not. Do that. I don't care if it's so, not smart. If it's, if it's, you're dead. <laughs> exactly. It's like that's the strongest argument for AI alignment kind of argument, though, which is like I don't care if it's conscious or if it's made sure. of a neural network or a fucking prologue or whatever. I don't care. What matters is that we're building systems that can make good decisions, that can optimize their actions to achieve goals in complex environments. Mm. How this is achieved and whatever doesn't really matter. Yeah. We, can just, we can just say by fire, assume an optimizer exists mm -hmm. that can be given a goal and will optimize for it. If you accept that, that this is just possible at all, which is the entire field of AI. Like, if you're working in AI and you don't believe this is possible, well, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Why are you in this field? The whole point of AI is to build AI. Why are you here? No, I, I, I thought that AI was, you know, something that played chess and do, did funny tricks on the internet. Yeah, but oh. it, I mean, yeah, but that's the AI effect. <laughs> People used to say, oh, the minute it can play chess, that is real AI. Then it's I know, I know. Like, oh, no, no, no. And trolling, and trolling. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm just saying, like, for the audience, maybe that's heard sure. that. It's a very common thing. So it's like uh, I think so, I think it was Stuart Russell who made who made this interesting this good point. It's basically um, the whole field somehow has this huge blind spot of like what happens if we succeed? Like what if we just yeah mm -hmm. succeed? Somehow no one's thinking about this. AI mm -hmm. alignment is about just taking seriously. What if our things just actually <laughs> work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember. I, th I think he's, he he said. He says this on on local talks and also um, in his book. Yeah, what if, what if AI succeeds? And then like it 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 asks the actual AI researchers to to think about wait what what do we do now? <laughs> and they're confused. Exactly, um, it's very strange for me. So I, that's why I find it very hard to steel man these anti alignment arguments because I don't really understand. Like some of these people seem to believe that AI is just impossible, which. I, is very strange to me than like, why do you work on AI? Like, mm -hmm. what are you doing here? And some people seem to, like unwilling to accept even the hypoth hypothetical. Like, mm. okay, well, assuming you would succeed, what then? So people, so, or sometimes people say, oh, that's a hundred years away. But even if it's a hundred years away, I still think it's worth thinking about. Sure, I, I guess. I guess my intuition is that people are like prefer thinking about things that are that make them happy. Um, oh, good. Course, yeah, of course. I, I was trying to just <laughs> take outside view. Sure, sure, sure. Inside view, those people are all fucking liars, <laughs> or like at least lying to themselves. Um, you know? Well, yeah. L let's try not to um, say bad things um, about most, like on about most. People. I think most people are genuine. I think most mm -hmm. people are very genuine in this regard. I think mm -hmm. they've just never thought about it really, mm -hmm. which is strange, but. Uh, that's how the culture of the field works. Mm -hmm. I think the vast majority of people in AI just never really thought about it much. And and, and maybe there's like, as you say about optimization processes, um, you know, society uh, doesn't optimize for people saying their true beliefs on the internet because their careers would be ruined. So most people yeah, are, are censored and maybe a lot of them read less wrong and think like you, uh, but there's they're a, not incentivized saying. to say it. Yeah, there's a great saying, uh, never trust a man to uh, believe something or to, to know something or understand something if his salary depends on not understanding it. Mm -hmm.
And it's, I think that's a common dynamic is that these beliefs are associated with a dude that wrote a, a 2000 page Harry Potter fanfic. So it's kind of like a low status thing. We're not allowed to talk about this. Oh, um, sure. Okay. So, so it's, 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 it's like uh, kind of signaling your low status to code um, fanfic either uh, compared to like quoting nervous papers. Um, yeah, exactly. It, it, it's like uh, AI Live didn't come from the academia establishment. It didn't come from the serious people with serious titles. It came from a dude, you know, and like five other, and you know, a bunch of other people on a mailing list in the early 2000s. And um, one of the things that's just extremely important to understand about humans' work is humans take status extremely seriously. Wait, wait, wait. W w what about quantum physics? Like it also also like came as something very weird. And like those were like smart people with high status, like Eisenberg, and and well, like yeah, his friend was like all the all the top guys in physics. Yeah, and and and, and like what, that's and they had a, a huge debate, and and nobody like they were arguing forever. So like even with high status people, you can argue. For, yeah. So it's, it's not necessarily contradicting contradicting your point. It's, it's more like another example of um, strange idea that kind of um, where, where people could talk about it. Um, Yes, yeah. and I, I expect alignment, it's already in the progress, alignment is being accepted into the canon of academic thought, because it's obviously a good thing to be thinking about, like, you know, Stuart Russell and other professors starting to, like, explicitly talk about it mm -hmm. as an acceptable thing. There's a, I forgot who wrote this, but, like, I remember reading a blog post or maybe some, I, I don't remember what it was, maybe it was a tweet of someone's Say that you, you always want to be the second person to to like discover something because like the first person to come up sure. with it, the second yeah. person is doing the one to like publicize it, and then mm -hmm. would you ever actually what you want to be is you want to be the first professor to notice it. You want to be the first high status person to notice it because you don't have to because even if you say oh this was all invented by this other person, no one's going to quote them. They're only going to cite you because you're the high status person. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I guess we have those like high status professors. Uh, we have Stuart Russell, Lee Bostrom. Um, but Yudkowsky didn't didn't get the the whole the, the whole credit. Um, I have like two two other things I, I want to talk about, um, which um, is of specific interest to me. Is that I think I think like to to, to make a transition, um, what Jan Lukun like if, if if I try to steal money and Lukun, it, um, he says something like, um, how could we possibly align those uh, very smart agents if we don't know anything about them, and uh, it would be like um, trying to change the sex of an angel or something, or um, and and somehow um, if you think about it, um, there is like some kind of uncertainty about how much we can influence the future. Like um, like the the, the steel man of like people in the, in the industrial revolution, you're brought like two hundred years back. Like what do you do to like <laughs> uh, have a powerful impact? Uh, well, I, mean, yeah, I can ask a simple question. Do you think Marx had any influence on the current times? Yes. He lives in the industrial ages. Do you think he had any influence? I think he had some influence. But like, like okay, so, but what was his marginal impact? So like, imagine Marx didn't exist. How many years would we wait before someone like Marx says something similar? I don't know. I can't rerun history, but it might have well never happened. Or we might have had a completely <laughs> different ideology that had like some, that filled the well, same niche. Maybe fascism would have just taken over the entire world, and that just would have so, been it. Yeah, because it just like somehow at some point I thought that like Bostrom's book about superintelligence was very influential, as it motivated people like Elon Musk to take to take it seriously, and um, it has some very positive impact. So I, I considered like writing those kind of books to be huge impact, but after thinking more about it, I, I just realized that you know we're all humans with similar ideas, so like. Like if Bostrom Adam wrote it, like maybe someone else would have like three, three years later. So I would greatly recommend you read a book called Inadequate Equilibria by Yeah, I, I read it. <laughs> so if you've read it, I have no idea why you're making this argument because the world is not efficient. Okay, and, okay, okay, and, okay. And I get this it. is not we are not efficiently exploiting the maximum research you could do on AI alignment or the best books. Oh, yeah, 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 we're not, we're not, we're, we're, we're 100% So not. in that sense, every marginal Yudkowsky or Bostrom you get is a huge net positive. Oh, yeah, 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 it's, it's huge, uh, but it's not like as huge as like, like comparing zero to like this, it's like huge compared to like winning two or three years or, or four or five years, which is, which is still huge. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And so to, so, so what you're what what you were saying in this podcast was like, 
we don't care about, we, we can still reason about what those very smart agents can do uh, in an abstract way without like delving into details of architecture. And so one thing, yeah, I, I would, go ahead. I would, no, I'd say it differently. So first of all, um, let me say something very snarky to Lacun for, for clickbait. Um, Mr. Lacun, I don't hate you, but I'm gonna say something snarky about you now. Uh, if Lacun thinks we can't reason at all about intelligence, he must be a really terrible artificial intelligence researcher, huh? Has he learned nothing that you can think about? That seems kind of strange. I've learned a lot about artificial intelligence studying it. Uh, are, what are the other artificial intelligence people studying? I don't know, seems kind of weird. So I've been studying a lot of artificial intelligence. I learned a lot of useful things about optimization processes, about reward functions, about things. Sure, I might not know exactly how, you know, the paperclip maximizer string to be built, but I have a lot of good guesses. Like, I think there's a really realistic possibility that the, uh, you know, whatever is the first AGI, the first PEAI or whatever, is going to just actually be a neural network built with PyTorch running on GPUs in the next 10 years. I think it's a real possibility. Yeah. And yeah, now that we see this convergence in the brain with, you know, in the brain algorithms and Batprop, and it's all like just Bayes, like, would you not say that knowing about Bayes, uh, you know, Bayes optimality is not a progress in understanding what intelligence is and reasoning about intelligent agents? I, I find it very strange that these people who apparently haven't taken five minutes to think about uh, how to reason about intelligence and how to think about agents say, well, it's impossible to reason about. But it feels to me like they haven't tried. Like if you tried five minutes to think about what can I, like what more than random, what better than random can I say about a future intelligence? So may, you maybe, come up with a lot of things. maybe I think, I think where they're coming from um, is from an engineering perspective. Like someone would try, like would try to like build the first, uh, you know, conveyor, uh, conveyors in the early, like in the end 1990s. Like you, you want to like, they think that engineering is hard and, and that like you will, like people who try to align those things will be the builders and that people who reason about those things in the kind of abstract way, in a text way, without like actually building things, don't actually understand and won't like have an impact. And I, I think that's like most likely engineering steel man, where like thinking about things and like yeah. philosophy is not important. I think that's a fair argument, but I, I think it's oversimplifying. I mean, if that was true, then why do we have theoretical phys you know, physicists? We should just kick yeah. them all out because I'm obviously not doing it. And I'm, like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just like straw manning it. So, like, you steal men, and I'll be straw man it. The straw man is why do we have theoretical physics? Why don't we have mathematicians? Like, we should just not have any mathematicians. They should just all go do experiments instead. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think we need both. Like, I agree that if you just put a bunch of theoretical physicists in a box, you're not going to get a good theory of the universe, obviously. You, you can get but, a nuclear bomb out of it. <laughs> uh, you, know, you still need you still need physics, like theoretical uh, practical experimentalists for that too. So, um, did they practice? Did they? Oh, okay. they did. They did some experiments in Manhattan Project, but they didn't course, do there much. Lots of experiments. It was it was mostly engineering actually. It's like the the theoretical thing. Uh, Nuclear Secrecy blog has a good post on this where they argue we all think the theory was that important, but it actually wasn't because that was the part that was declassified. So they kept all the engineering classified, but they declassified all the theory because they thought it wasn't as important. Like the really hard part about building the bomb was just like all the DuPont engineers work of just, you know, creating pipes that can contain uranium hexafluoride and, you know, build just really big factories because you need really big factories. So nuclear secrecy blog, it's a, it's a good blog that has a lot of info on that. But nuclear, so like, I agree, it? nuclear secrecy, I think this mm. is what it's called. I forgot who the guy is who runs it, but he has a lot of great, he's, he's a historian. He has a lot yeah, of yeah, blog dot nuclear nuclear secrecy. Secrecy. com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Great, great blog. Um, but basically, so, but I do agree. I think engineering is undervalued in this regard. So like, uh, please don't cast me as someone who says that we should just all sit in a cave and just like not look at neural networks. I am the opposite of that. I work with neural networks every day because I expect mm. to learn things from building these large language models and from experimenting on these large language models. I would, I would describe myself as an empirical alignment theorist. I work empirically with the, with the machines I do. So I think, these, there is a acceptable chance, like maybe 10 to 30 percent, that the models we're currently building will just scale to what will later be considered to be AGI. And so mm -hmm. we should be starting experimenting with them right now. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's what's called in the literature, um, as you know, prosaic alignment. And yeah. um, I think one, one um, interesting take was, I think, Paul Cristiano's recent blog on 
his research um, protocol where like he tried to experiment on things and try to see if, if, if his alignment techniques scale or not. But at one point I, I saw you making um, about reasoning about um, not experimenting, but like um, the usefulness of math in thinking about agents was that um, there, there was like this space of like decision theories, which is quite large. And um, given a duty function, you, can, you could find the best uh, decision theory that maximizes this duty function. Like I, I, I haven't seen much people making distinction, the distinction, distinction between utility and decision theory. Um, and so, I, so yeah, I just, I just found that super interesting. I, I don't know how much we can apply that for, um, you know, like, yeah, I don't have a precise question about it. I just found this, that interesting. If I have, if I could, I would, if I could just take Neary, you know, and put them in a cave for 10,000 years and just like then extract <laughs> papers from them, I would prefer, I would love to do that before we did to build AGI, just to see what they find, you know? I don't know if the decision theory research is going to lead us anywhere, but I think it's worth exploring. The same way exploring, you know, abstract math and Bayes theorem and quantum physics is useful. I, I see... Like, I think decision theory has helped you confuse a lot of questions. So Miri has this great blog post where they say, questions start as philosophy, then they become math, and then they become engineering. Mm -hmm. First, you ask yourself the question, what is even the question I'm asking? What are we even interested in? And someone starts hacking away at that with math, it's like models and systems and like, you know, it's like toy experiments and whatever. And then an engineer takes the math and actually turns it into a system that runs. And this is a process I think happens in most scientific disciplines. Like decision theory was an attempt to go from philosophical experiment with what does rationality mean to turn it into math. And now with and now AI is the engineering part of taking decision theories and whatever, and it gives inspiration, not literally implementing them step by step, but taking this inspiration, taking Bayes as an inspiration for how these things might be able to think. At this point, Connor had to leave. So what you're about to hear in the second part, which happened one week later, over Twitch. During the first 10 minutes, I unfortunately forgot to check if Connor's voice was being recorded, so the start would likely feel a bit abrupt. If I recall correctly, I was prompting him on Eleuther AI's current projects, and especially his involvement with EEGI, or Eleuther Experiments in General Intelligence. Back to our main program. More towards human values, or just being useful in different ways. Um, so far, not much has happened. It's most of it's been kind of like you know me and two other people, kind of in private chat. Um, uh, but we're trying to move this into a more open state. We also want to work more on interpretability, so like understanding what these models do internally and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, I want to make this all open source, all open at Luther, so anyone can work with me. I expect in the near future there's going to be work there to be done. Um, at the moment, not really. It's like soon, TM. You know, like keep an eye out if you want to work with me on that. Um, we're mostly going to need ML engineers, probably, uh, but also some web dev work. Though we do already have some great web devs ML, working with us. ML engineers is quite uh, a broad, uh, you know, range of people. So maybe more like deep learning engineers that can do TensorFlow mesh. <laughs> well, no, we don't use TensorFlow anymore. It's all PyTorch, like Oh, it's PyTorch now. Okay. It's and all PyTorch. What? We have, we have we have left GTF, uh, TensorFlow behind and do not look back. Oh, cool, cool. So PyTorch on this uh, new sponsor, um, right? Yeah. Hardware. So we have a lot of GPUs from them that we need to do most of our experiments on. So as I said, the work I'm doing with EGI is still very early stages, mm -hmm. like very small models, just trying to experiment. Yeah. Um, if you are, if you, the listener, are. Um, <laughs> a experienced ML engineer or someone who has experience with high performance computing, please consider contributing to NUX. NUX is a huge data, uh, is a huge you know, code base that uh, there's a lot to do. Uh, Sid does a great job of keeping issues up to date on the GitHub repo. So you can just check out the GitHub New repo, look X. at the issues, and you can also hit up uh, Sid or me or Stella or anyone anytime, and we're happy to get you into the code base. Um, so it's like not something that a beginner can do. That's unfortunate. That's the unfortunate part about the UX. It's not really something a beginner can do. You mm -hmm. should, you need to have some experience to get into that code base. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's like the main public or right? private. I, I don't say. It. Sorry. Can uh, you is that? that is, yeah, on GitHub on, on the uh, GitHub website. Is it public? The stuff you just mentioned. Yeah. It's all all public. What what was the name again? Uh, so the new X rep, rep, you mean? Uh, so if you go to the, if you go to our website, you can click on the new X link and it will get you to the website, to our GitHub repo, where we oh, have okay. all of our code. Oh, okay, 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 sure, sure. Um, 
yeah, let me do that. Oh, it's not important. Um, okay, and and so yeah, so this EEG thing, so to to call um, to frame it for the listeners is experimental experiences. No, it's uh, illusory, illusory experiments experiences. in general intelligence. General intelligence, yeah, right. It's just a funny name I came up with. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's a bit like EEG, but like for AGI, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you, you're starting from this paper, uh, I, I guess from Paul Cristiano or the OpenAI team, mm -hmm. on yep. learning to summarize from human feedback, right? Exactly. And so uh, our, fir our first step is going to be replicating the results of that paper mm -hmm. kind of because I think they use very interesting techniques that I expect to scale and like a lot of variants of those techniques that I want to experiment with. And mm -hmm. so we're trying to first get our feet wet, you know, get the, um, get this set up, try experiment with like models and yeah, take it from there. Sure. And, um, well, I see you have like already a website it's called, I think it's like Luther AI dot, uh, something, uh, maybe like, NLP, okay, uh, let me find my notes. Um, yours is called eege.illiter.ai, where you actually have something where you can pick some summary and then you can like, like give your feedback, right? So like kind of yeah, that's, that's feedback. experimental. That's also experimental. So nothing, nothing for the public yet. Um, that's down the line. At some point, uh, what we hope to do is is to create uh, have an interface where you where we have users directly interact with these models and give feedback on their performance. Mm -hmm. So like we'll have the 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 model summarize text or chat or perform other activities, and mm -hmm. we'll have users rate their ability. And we're going to use that feedback using some advanced methods to try to improve their performance for the users' um, application or you know, whatever they want. You know whatever the goal is that we're working on. Mm -hmm. But that's down the line where it's very experimental. You know, um, talk again in a few months. <laughs> How many months? All depends on what you want to see. So I expect that we should be able to replicate the results of the paper, at least for the smaller models, or in the next like I don't know, maybe one to two months, uh, depending on compute availability and like how big the models are and there's other things. Um, making it more open to the public and like you know training uh, individual models, we'll have to see about that. Um, it really will depend on like how much work new X needs, how hard a few technical challenges are going to be. But I expect in about like six months time, I expect us to have some really cool results to show. That's kind of my timeline right now. It's like six months, I think we'll have some very cool things to show. Cool, yeah, because I'm, I'm super interested in that because um, I think, I think uh, yeah, uh, mixing RL and, and NLP is the way to go, and I I love this approach with uh, just like learning um, human preferences from feedback on you know is there is this a good uh, upper uh, backflip? Yeah, yeah, so exactly. This, this paper is good, and and so if we consider now that NLP is the most scalable way into AGI, and it makes sense to kind of align align it and and make some kind of RL feedback loop. Uh, do you do you understand how the um, reward model look um, right uh, look, works because like I, I, tried, I just look at the paper at the blog post quickly and it seems that you train a reward model and then um, you train something that summarizes and you train something that like a, a policy to switch between different summaries yeah, can you just like go through uh, the loop maybe um, so the way the paper does it is is that um, they collect human feedback on pairs of um, summaries so they have like human generate summaries and uh, ai generate summaries and they'll show humans a pair of them they'll say two um summaries of the same text mm -hmm. and then the human will ra will rate which one of them they like more then they train a reward model to predict you know given a, a two texts like which one would the human like more and they basically use that kind of like as a reward signal to then use rl uh use ppo to fine-tune a gpt model as a policy to generate these kinds of um, summaries. They also use a third model as a um, kind of like as a kind of regularizer. So basically what happens is if you just train these models kind of naively is that they overfit to the reward model and they find like ways to hack it. They find like weird ways of just like repeating one word over and over and over again. And for some reason that confuses the reward model and gets like really high reward, even so it's not what we want. So it's, it's a bit of a hack, but basically what they do is, is that they take an untrained, like just like a, a pre-trained, but like a not a fine-tuned GPT mm -hmm. model, 
and they take a KL divergence between um, the pot fine-tuned policy and the baseline GPT and uh, penalize the model if it diverges too far from the baseline. And okay, and so they give it uh, like b bad reward, or yeah, it's basically is that if the, if the text is too weird, if it's too far from normal human text, it gets a negative reward for that. Okay, okay, and that in, that encourages it to stay kind of within the bounds of normal human language, instead of you know producing this one token that it just like repeats over and over or something like that. Hmm, and. Okay, so how much compute would that need? Uh, because there's like the whole, uh, like uh, how much compute did OpenAI use, right? Um, a lot. So the <laughs> OpenAI, so like currently we don't have the kind of compute laying around that would be needed to fully reproduce, especially for the larger models. It is a lot of compute that goes through these kinds of things. That's why I'm taking it slow. I'm not like committing to any timelines too much because this will depend a large degree on compute constraints. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it might turn out that some of these things uh, are much harder to get, you know, to get the compute than we currently hope. Um, you know, we're all figuring this out as we go. But yeah, in the paper, it's uh, especially the larger models. So, like, in, in the ideal world, I would like to experiment with models in like the 10 billion parameter range, like 10 to 13 billion. It like, would be the ideal size of models for me. Um, I expect there to be interesting performance characteristics uh, that I will see in those models that I can't see in like 1 billion parameter models or smaller models. It's just a hunch. I might be wrong, but I have a good feeling about it. If if possible, I wish I could do you know the two hundred billion parameter model. I think that'd be even better, <laughs> but that's not feasible. Hmm. So more more than more than the number of parameters. From, so, yeah. How, how does the network differs from like how does the language model differs from GPT three? Is it the same architecture or do they have something special? Uh, it's basically it's the same architecture. The same architecture and yeah. plus plus PPO and yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, how how longer it, it it would take, um, and hmm, what's the what's the next milestone for GPT Neo X? Um, at this moment, um, other than you know just like fixing bugs, um, improving efficiency, experimenting, checking different things, it we're just hardware bound. So we're just waiting basically. Um, the chip short has hit Cloud Core Weave. You know they've ordered tons and tons of GPUs, but they just haven't arrived. And we're just waiting for them to arrive, really. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're we're ready to scale up to larger sizes. We're probably going to train like a mid-sized model. I I assume like a thirteen or twenty billion parameter model. And then we're probably going to do a two hundred billion uh, once the hardware is there. I, I I don't fully grasp how hard it is to go from thirty billion to uh, two hundred. So like. I know. Very. I, I know we get more sample efficient. Is, is that true that we get more sample efficient when the bigger the model is? Yes, but the model is bigger, so the <laughs> amount of compute you have to put in the model so, and the number of GPUs is of course higher. So basically, if you know how much compute you have ahead of time, you can calculate like the optimal model size you want to train. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what. You know our final hardware is going to look like. I don't know what the perfect model is going to look like. We're probably going to train at two hundred billion for the meme, anyways, because it's just a nice number to go for. But yeah, we'll see what comes out of that. Hmm. Do Do you see the the Twitch comments? Because like I I cannot see any of them. This is very bad. I uh, I just keep like browsing. Uh, I don't have it open. Okay. Okay. Because I don't see anything. Um. Because I need to put it in my my big screen, and if I do it, I lose the the conversation. Maybe, okay, let's try for five seconds if there's, um, and I mute it. Okay, so there was comments before, and now there's not, no, no more comments. I don't, I don't get it. Um, I don't know, I think probably not that many people watching. Okay, but there, there were comments before. Okay, um, anyhow, um, so yeah, I guess my, so if you, if you scale to, from 30 billion to 200, so you get seven times more uh, parameters, but then there's like it's more coefficient. So like, what does the scaling law tells approximately? Um, we don't know what the final hardware is going to look like, um, so I can't give like a specific answer. And we're probably just going to train the two hundred billion parameter models for the fun of it. <laughs> just going to try. <laughs> yeah, but we don't we'll know. see. Our goal is like two hundred billion, and we want to get the hardware to make that happen. But you know, this is all up to Core Weave and how things end up working. Wasn't the meme like one terabyte or die or something? 
Well, what one tri oh, a trillion or bust, uh, but that's not happening. That's just physically impossible. Like you know, you need a. I, I don't know. Maybe the biggest supercomputers in the world could train that. Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we not nothing we have access to. A trillion is a meme. Mm -hmm. No one's done that. Like the the switch transformer doesn't count. Well, Nvidia Nvidia is going for one trillion, right? I, I they're definitely trying. Uh, I think it's definitely possible that that they will succeed in the near future. But at the moment, no one has done it, and we're not going to be the first one to do it. Sure, sure. But like, I, okay, when when do you expect there's a fifty percent chance of Nvidia releasing their one trillion model? I mean, fifty percent chance today. <laughs> Today you just like drop a coin uh, maybe, and you're like, oh, I'm good. Yeah, I dropped this. <laughs> maybe at fifty percent. I mean, I expect like um, if their GTC keynote is true and all the things they say is true, we should expect a trillion parameter model sometime this year or next year. I would say. I mean, Switch Transformer exists, which is like a uh, sparse trillion parameter model. I don't think that counts. Uh, sparse models um, aren't as powerful as similarly sized um, dense models. But yeah, I expect a, a trillion parameter dense model pretty soon. Um, OpenAI is also teasing that they have something that you know blows GPT-3 out of the water. Like I think Ilya has tweeted about that in the past, and that's probably going to come out at some point. Hmm. And yeah, recently there was a bunch of conversation on the Discord about Huawei getting this. Is it Huawei or Chinese hardware? Uh, yeah, Huawei. I crazy. Think. So like everyone is like coming up with trillion parameters. Um, like the, 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 it's the new vibe. They're just yeah, the, yeah. The, there is a scaling race happening right now, which I'm very not happy with. Um, but it is kind of like a, a you know, big numbers go burr. You know, like ooh, look at the, you know, look at how big our number is. Oh, our number is bigger than your number. That's just how humans work. Uh -huh. You know, it's like a, it's a clear prestige thing for you know big companies and increasingly governments to, um. How you know, show these like large um, models that they could train. The most interesting thing about the Huawei um, model is that it was trained fully on Chinese hardware, so Chinese CPUs, Chinese accelerators, Chinese everything. That was very interesting. The model itself is kind of terrible from everything I can tell. Uh, it was only trained for like a tenth as long as GPT-3. Um, also, like on Chinese text of questionable quality. Not that I can evaluate Chinese text. It's just what I've heard. So uh, it's not like equivalent to GPT-3 or anything. Um, I personally don't see how, you know, China is going to catch up in AI, quote unquote, in any reasonable capacity, you know, with the kind of censorship and the kind of like weird incentives that exist in China anyways. Well, it's, um, they have those weird incentives that make them, um, you know, go more private, um, do their own thing, fight the, the entire world. So they, they, they could just like have the smartest people working on something forever without telling anyone. And just no, they can't. I do not believe they are capable of doing that. People very much overestimate. Like one thing I uh, like, I think Anders Sandberg said this very great is that top secret projects usually suck. Top secret projects are usually really, really terrible because they don't get the feedback from the from like the really smartest from the community and the smartest people. And the smartest people usually don't want to work on top secret projects, mm. especially not with like crushing bureaucracy as it exists in like China and stuff. Is that let, let me put it this way. Say you were the best AI researcher in the world, right? Mm -hmm. You could work anywhere you want. Would yep. you pick China? Not really. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it's a whole paper uh, from Bostrom about uh, openness in AI. Like, the, um, like, is it, like, would we expect in the future to have more openness? Because today, there's like a bunch of uh, value for people uh, to, 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 to do open work, to publish op uh, openly, to have open source code. Um, so people don't want to go to China and, and, and work in private because their career will be ruined. And yeah, they don't want open source, like they want open source, right? Um, the, the, the incentives currently don't really, like the Chinese market has a lot of problems. Um, uh, and also Chinese legal system and censorship system. Like imagine if your GPT-3 Chinese starts talking about Tiananmen Square, you know, you have to censor that somehow. You can't say that, otherwise the party's gonna be really unhappy with that. What's, what's like imagine you are, Hmm? What's the Tiananmen Square? Yeah, Tiananmen Square massacre. It's uh, oh, it was a yeah, massacre yeah. where the mm. yeah, and that's heavily censored. And obviously, a GPT three model, you know, would pick up on that, and thus you do extremely heavy censoring, which would completely gimp the model's performance. I expect. 
So I think it's all a joke. Like people who say, oh, China doesn't, you know, has so much data and they don't care about privacy. It's all bullshit. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's such a, you know, clusterfuck of bureaucratic nightmares is that like, it's it's way easier to get a huge data set in just, you know, being in America and just Googling things. <laughs> you know, who cares about like all that kind of, the one thing that Chinese are good at is facial recognition and all, you know, and like spying on their citizens. That's the one thing they're good at, which I'm not happy about. But other than that, who cares? But they, they do publish papers that get... Yeah, they publish papers. Let's, 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 let's be clear here. Papers. The, the highest cited papers do not come out of China. This is just a fact. There are wonderful, really good Chinese scientists. Suspiciously, many of them work on facial recognition that come out of China, and they do publish papers, and there's a huge number of papers. But the, um, China has like a very different incentive system when it comes to uh, publishing papers. Like often, China to like to like advance your career, you have to like publish a lot of papers, and it's completely irrelevant how good they are. They of course would claim otherwise, but like anyone, every every person I know that's related to the that's worked in the Chinese system will tell you that like you get a bonus for like publishing in journals depending on like point systems. You know, it, it's silly. It's like you think the American system is corrupt. You think the American academic system is is corrupt, which I think it is. Chinese is like ten times worse. It's it's all a big it's all a big meme. But, but then the question is is um, you know it's like Europe kind of building these um, experiments uh, on on AGI, and I guess at some point we'll get some race to scaling, and at some point it will become scarier and scarier and, and closer to actual uh, even human level at least human level uh, text prediction, um, and so. I had this discussion on the Discord with I think it's called 3D 3D printer or something, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a discussion between multipolar scenarios, and um, actually having one big uh, corporation winning the AI race, and at the beginning I was convinced that you know OpenAI were great, um, maybe DeepMind is cool too. They have co-founders interested in AI safety, so maybe if if like DeepMind become very good. And then OpenAI joins them because they have that in their like legal policy. Then we have like one very strong actor that will make everything safe, right? <laughs> and that would be and, an ideal case if that works. Yeah, I thought I thought it was the, the ideal case, but then the guy convinced me after a bunch of messages. Then then multiple scenarios were better if if we had like a bunch of decentralized kind of AGI groups, um, kind of helping each other or like correcting each other because you know if you're it's harder to be to be smarter than all the other ais in the world right um so sure i, I feel like eleuther falls into the second category where you're trying to like level up by the like everyone has, has the same open source software or at least like the api and a, a bit like the open ai um argument from elon musk at the beginning right um I uh, do not subscribe to that argument of Elon Musk, by the way. I, I think Elon Musk, I do not like his opinions about AI at all. I think he's crazy uh, when it comes to AI. I like him. I like a lot of his work, but I think he's crazy when it comes to AI. Um, so this is an extremely nuanced topic. This is not A is good and B is bad. Sure, this sure, is yeah. an extremely is complicated new, topic, yeah. and no one knows what the right thing to do is. Mm -hmm. And this isn't like multipolar versus unipolar as if we had a choice. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have a choice in this regard. The way I see the situation personally, well, at least well, well, at the well, moment, well. that you have a choice between open sourcing GPT two, three, or not. But that won't change. I don't. I literally don't think that changes anything in in the multipolar versus um, only unipolar setup. I don't think there's like any action I could take that would encourage a unipolar outcome, in like any non-trivial capacity. So the way I see it is the following: I think that um, coordination is extremely hard. I am extremely pessimistic about any kind of coordination among humans. I literally think it's easier to build a fully aligned super intelligence than it is to get humans to cooperate on large scales. Uh, so like, I, I don't think that like all AI companies could coordinate without detection to like stop AI research. I don't think that's possible. I, I, I just don't think it's possible. Um, so the way I see it is the only possible way we have hope of this going well at all it's just we develop a technical solution to AI alignment or methods to AI alignment that are competitive, easy to use, and you know so good that there's just no incentive to not use them. If we develop a method, but it makes your AI a million times slower, no one's going to use it or we're all going to die. 
if we create a you know if we create a method and then um, there's some way it's like hard to implement or only one person in the world understand it, we all die. The only way I think we could get it is that it has to be simple. It has to be well, or at least you know, implementable. It or we, you know, people are there to make it implementable. It has to be competitive. It has to be highly performant. It also the, the resulting AI also has to be powerful. So like, there's no there's no use building a weak like a like an AI aligned AI that is then weak and immediately destroyed by the second AI that's unaligned that is much stronger. Mm-hmm. So you also need to build an AI alignment that you know strong alignment agent that can defend itself against potential. So that's the, the big danger with multipolar outcomes is that we could have like say we build three aligned AGIs mm-hmm. for this multipolar scenario, but then a fourth person builds a paperclip maximizer that blows up the world, then you know we still lose. You know, or even if the even if they manage to fight back the paperclip maximizer, but you know they nuke the entire surface of the planet in the process, or whatever. So, so we need to build some kind of. Um... This uh, whole like iterated amplification s- scenario from Paul Cristiano, and and we need to add some constraints like please make sure that people don't build stronger AGIs. So we we, we never end up in like no mass surveillance. No one knows how to solve intelligence. Amplification is not a solution to intel- to uh, uh, alignment. I expect if you would implement iterated amplification as described, you would paperclip the universe, or worse actually. I don't think it would work as it currently is. And Cristiano does know on that, though this is working on it. But there is no proposal that currently exists for alignment that is ready to implement. And even those that are like have some like good ideas, I would not give them more than like a 10% chance of working. Mm-hmm. We are in a very early stage of our understanding of these problems. There has been massive, in my opinion, progress on these problems, but it's just an incredibly hard project. And and and, and yeah. the progress is 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 massive compared to what, where it was before. So it's more access, yes. accepted and soft. And we have maybe like a hundred papers a year on AI alignment or something tops. Um, maybe a thousand if you count like uh, robustness and, and 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 so on. But then um, but then there's like these massive companies like Huawei, uh, Nvidia, and like throwing like. B- millions and billions of dollars at, uh, at this research, right? So I, th- I don't know if AI alignment is scaling as well, as much as the rest of the economy, right? We don't need AI alignment to scale. We need AI alignment to work. It, it, we need a solution to alignment. It doesn't matter how many papers we publish. It doesn't matter how much funding it has. What The only thing that matters is, is that we have a understanding of the problem and a solution to the problem that people building the AIs can build. My hope for things to work is is that no one is incentivized to build an unaligned AI. You don't win by building like if you build an unaligned AGI, you get fucked too. Like no one wants to build an well, unaligned AGI. They're like but people what's happening? killing people with but, shotguns, right? I'm sorry, what was that? Sorry, uh, pe- people do kill other people with shotguns. Like they're like some ev- evil people trying to just fuck up the world. Well, yeah, okay, but I mean, if those people be the AGI, we're we're like super super triple quadruple uh, fucked. You know, if people build a military AI, AGI, we're so ultra mega super giga fucked. There's like, you know, like I don't even think about those scenarios because we're so fucked in such situations. Like if if things like go super multipolar and we have like World War Three and there's like take like decades of like military AI development, we are so ultra giga fucked. Like I, I it's like not even worth thinking about because it's like I don't even know how we recover from such a scenario. Like if so, if like governments like build AI AGI to literally optimize to kill humans. Like could you imagine the horror? Like like the unimaginable like hell like literal hell on earth. Well, I'm just like, I'm just thinking about like not someone someone so not like everyone can do it, but you know some Connor that tries to reproduce GPT two in 2030. Some someone else is like, oh, I'm going to try to reproduce this AGI paper that I'm not allowed to do, and you know tries to run it and. Um, if, 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 like, you know, the saying by Yudkowsky, like, AG, um, the IQ to create AGI drops by one uh, every year, kind of the similar thing. Uh, so if you have an IQ yeah. of 150 in 20 years, then you might be able to do it by yourself or. Yeah, I, I guess it's just who I expect, like the, um, I expect the end era of humans to end very shortly after the first AGI is built or the first TAI is built. I expect humans to not stick around for very long. Um, why? Because like we, expect, because we get uh, we get like neural implants or or AI. Yeah, like in the best case scenario, I mean, 
the average case scenario is a paperclip maximizer. Like the average, I expect like on average, like civilizations like ours in this situation, probably on average paperclip themselves. They create an AGI, it's like unaligned, and it just, you know, splats the, you know, takes apart the entire earth for resources to build mm -hmm. something. It doesn't hate humans, it's not evil. It just doesn't care. Mm -hmm. I think it's the default scenario. I think some minority of civilizations in our scenarios build demons, they build chaos gods, they build evil AI, like military AI that like tortures people, that like, you know, mm -hmm. creates simulations of a uh, you know, terrible situation or whatever. Something's called suffering risk or an mm -hmm. S risk. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm most worried about. And some people, some civilizations manage to get alignment right and to create like, you know, these like angelic super beings that, you know, can bring you know, peace and harmony and solve suffering and all these extremely hard problems and then expand on the universe. If we get a alignment right, that's what we get. But that's not the default scenario. Nature is allowed to kill us. We're allowed to lose. We're not the heroes in a novel. We're not predetermined by a script to win. We're just jumbles of atoms. We're just a civilization like any other in the universe. We can lose and we will lose if we don't get this right. If we don't solve the technical problem in time, we build AGI and we don't get have an understanding of how to align it, that's it, game over. So do you think do you think the, the great Caesar is ahead of us? I don't know. I don't know, but at the, at the current moment, I would say I'm more optimistic than I was a few years ago. I feel like progress and alignment has been a lot faster than I expected it to mm -hmm. be. So, but that means like I updated from say 5% success chance to maybe 15% success chance. It's possible and it doesn't mean not to work on There's literally no reason not to work on it because mm -hmm. the alternative is we were fucked anyways. So why not work on it? And it's also a fun thing to work on. I enjoy working on alignment very, very much. Mm -hmm. And if it increases our chances even marginally, I mean, what else are you going to do with your, you know, like it's just the obvious thing. It's at least for people like me, I think it's the obviously correct thing to be working on. And I think there's hope, there is a chance um, that we get this right. I personally like skeptical, these like intermediate scenarios that I think like Cristiano and other people take very seriously. I was like, like Kais, like, you know, comprehensive AI services scenarios and whatever, where mm -hmm. they say like, okay, we have AGI, but it's like neither super aligned or like super unaligned, or like mm -hmm. this like intermediate thing, like humans stick around. I don't think that's gonna happen. I, I don't expect really any humans to be around by 2100. You know, either or if they do exist, they only exist in like stasis pods or something. Wait, uh, I don't, I don't think C C A I S the thing from uh, De Dexler Drex Drexler Drexler um, is is about humans sticking around until two hundred two thousand hundred. It's just like AI takes. No, those are two different art things. Uh, oh, I just said Kais is like, I don't, it's like in Kais, there's like non alignment problem. Like you don't really have like, you don't have paperclip optimizers, but you also don't have, you know, singleton AI. You have like neither. I don't expect these, these intermediate scenarios. I don't, I don't right, right. put like, much probability mess on this. Okay. Because I, I, I put some decent probability on that happening uh, after reading, I think this the summary of, of it from Rohan. Um, I don't. I, I think I don't understand Kais. I, it makes no sense to me. Like I, I've read it. I've I've read the whole thing. Oh, the whole and thing. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, I've read the whole thing. It makes no sense to me. It's completely silly. Like I think a Kais scenario can exist stably for maybe like two years before some of the Kais things become agentic and take over all the other agents, and then you know we'd have agents again. It's like dude, Gorn has the has the de facto post on this called Tool Why Tool AI Wants to Be Agents. And I expect that to happen. It's like when you have a sufficiently complex service system, it will become agentic. You'll have inner alignment failure. You'll have MISA optimizers take over or, you know, like just like someone just builds an agent. Someone just, some hedge fund just sits down and say, okay, I'm going to build an agent that maximizes profit. Like that's, I think, one of the most likely scenarios how these things go to shit is, you know, we're just going to have some stupid corporation be like, all right, lol AI, you know, just create profit. And then so, you know, it just tiles the universe with like, you know, very large Bitcoin numbers or something. <laughs> Okay, so so at the end is more like a human failure. It's like the human. No, that's not the most likely scenario. The most likely scenario by far is just we just build a thing, something weird happens, and we all just fall over dead. <laughs> you know, it's just like you know, just some, we build some weird AGI. It it has some weird paper clippy goal. It has some weird Mesa optimization or something. Like we have like GPT three, GPT N like seven or whatever, and we uh, prompt it with something, instantiate some kind of like Mesa optimizing agent in its internal representation, it breaks out and you know does something weird. Um, I feel so scenarios like that are pretty likely. What is it pretty likely? I'm still talking like 
10 to 15 percent probability or something like 50 percent of my probability mass is always on unknown unknowns like something much weirder than i expect will happen mm -hmm. by default something much weirder than anything i can come up with is going to happen and i have no idea what it is and no one does knows what's going to happen but i feel like there's plenty there's just so many scenarios in how this could go wrong and it all is downstream of not getting alignment if you have if we understand the actual problem of alignment and we have technical solutions to these problems, all the other, you know, then we have a chance. If we don't have that, there is some chance, there is some possibility. I give it like maybe a 5% probability, maybe 10, more like five, that alignment just turns out to be really easy. So maybe it turns out we were just really confused and actually it's super easy. You just have to like do the thing and it just works every time. So, well, what do you uh, mean by, by like it works? So like imagine, imagine it works. Like we're in the year 200 and uh, 2100 and it works. So do, do we, do we have something very, very smart that cares, doesn't care about hurting humans or like cares about preserving humans. And we, we're just like, uh, merged we're merged with the ai or just like neural i mean that's a whole different question about like what should we want if we have alignment well, i actually like, genuinely when, when you say it works I, I just don't understand okay because when, when people say it no, works uh, I, go ahead. alignment is a philosophical problem philosophy is about figuring out what the question is we don't know what the question is we're trying to solve to a large degree is that and this is something that you just have to get used to if you're working in a pre phreatomatic field like when people try to figure out what causality is like you know in the early 1900s and 19th century or whatever people are like what does some it mean for something to cause something they couldn't answer that question like what does it mean to be good that's mm -hmm. a more clear like mm -hmm. people still argue what does it mean to be good that mm -hmm. is a question i think you can make progress on and some people would disagree with you on that i'm not saying more realism here like um i'm, I'm an anti-realist for the mm -hmm. most part but you can work on these problems and alignment not fully but to a large degree is about that alignment is about moving probability mass from the we paperclip everything or worse to the we don't do that scenarios what exactly those don't do that scenarios look like anything post singularity we can't predict for sure we can come up with some ideas you know every scientist in this field has some of his sci-fi visions a lot of them want to keep humans around a lot of you know, a lot of them you know want us to like be aug augmented or to like live in virtual reality or whatever like that. Um, I think it's pretty pretty quite likely that if we have like a better understanding of the problem and a better control of these agents, that we could you know live in a beautiful, wonderful, perfect virtual reality for you know millions of years or whatever. I think that's definitely possible. I'm more of a um, I guess feed the utility monster type person. I'm like why keep humans around? They're inefficient. Just create beautiful virtual minds that experience infinitely more pleasure and happiness and meaningful lives and so, think much more beautiful thoughts than humans do why keep around the humans seems inefficient uh but that's a bit controversial so you're you're altruistic so you would prefer to to die and have some utility monster getting hold the utility than... absolutely yeah of course just makes sense to me like why would i not it seems silly that well, the easiest decision of my life if I could just, you know, you know, kill myself right now and it would just make AI you know, alignment happen and beautiful utility monsters inhabit the entire universe, literally easiest decision of my life. I think, I think we can, we can maybe end on this because that's beautiful. And that, my dear, the augmented biological intelligences was the end of this first real Inside View podcast. If you found this conversation insightful, I strongly recommend joining Aloof the AI's Discord link in the description or even subscribe to the inside view channel on youtube i'm also curious what would be for you the pros and cons of open sourcing deep learning research when your long-term goal is to solve ai alignment you can send anonymous feedback on this video link in the description or just tag or dm me on twitter at michael Tradzi, spelled t-r-a-z-z-i